My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Andy Markison. We're at the Earth and Sea Restaurant in Carlton. It's June 14th, 2023. Andy, thank you so much well, for joining us today. Cheers. Uh, first question, why wine? Um, I think uh, given my background with restaurants, the beauty of wine um, is that is the ability to make your food taste better and vice versa. I think that that's what I latched onto. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of people in this industry that started with beer or spirits. And, you know, don't get me wrong, uh, as a baseball fan, uh, beer and a dog or, you know, uh, it has a time and place and nostalgia. But um, the way you can pair wine with food and really make both taste even better, it's the icing on the cake, is kind of what latched, uh, or what I latched onto, um, you know, and kind of essentially what my job is, you know, uh, people on a common, uh, on a regular basis, I should say, uh, want me to go over and pair wine, and it's not like one is better than the other, but my first uh, question to them is, what did you order? You know, and obviously there's some people that don't care and whatnot, but at the same time, even if they say, oh, we don't care, we just want this or that, there's still an underlying uh, intent with what I give them. Or uh, um, John Paul's wife, Terry, she's, uh, she always wants a white with her filet. And so to give her, a, I think last time I pulled out a white shot neuf to pop and she wanted a glass, but it's John Paul and Terry, they can have a, I'll open it up and uh, share the rest with the staff. So. She gets what she wants and the staff can be educated on uh, <laughs> what that is and the profile of it, um, you know, but that being said is a uh, challenge is always, always fun. Um, but essentially the short answer question is the, uh, the culinary aspect of that. Let's talk about life available before wine. Tell us about where you were born and raised and kind of life, life before wine. <laughs> uh, I was born uh, in uh, Orange, California, so Southern California, the old, old town of Orange County, if, as much as that sounds like an oxymoron that exists. Um, Chapman University is down that way. Um, it's a very uh, historical spot. It has the, still the old rotunda in the middle where they used to do town meetings. Actually, they filmed some Parks and Rec episodes there, believe it or not, as well as plenty of movies. Um, but um, I was born in that area, and I spent a lot of time out in Colorado. Our, my grandfather had a ranch out there. I grew up flying by myself when I was seven, when you were able to do that. And going out to Colorado and uh, New Mexico is very south. Um, and so I spent some time there. Uh, most of my education is in California, in the Orange County area. Um, I, uh, I lived in Denali, Alaska for a while, um, doing fine dining up there as well. Everyone assumes I was a crab fisherman, but I would drive to Alaska and back, so I've never seen the coast. Uh, I would go up like the uh, 101 all the way through, pass through Portland, Vancouver, BC. Whistler was literally the halfway point, and drive the length of BC, Yukon Territory, up through Fairbanks and down to Denali and live there from Basically, by the time I got there, because we left in April, I'd be about May and live May to Labor Day, and then we'd go down. Uh, but the way we'd go down is down the uh, Alcan Highway through Banff and Jasper and Calgary, Glacier National Park, um, Idaho, Utah, Vegas, and back down. And the only sad part about that is the stretch from Vegas to Southern California is probably the grossest stretch of the entire highway, uh, or the entire trip, I should say. So I went from seeing Banff and Jasper and you know, Yukon, or there's, you know, elk the size of school buses roaming free, and then you go through probably the place where uh, there's more trash on the ground and brown skies than I've ever seen. But at the same time, um, it made you appreciate all those other things. Uh, and so that's actually why I, uh, one of the reasons why I moved up here, um, you know, I didn't really understand maybe the magnitude of, um, especially California moving up here. Um, there's, <laughs> there's some great people that have moved up here um, that I've gotten to meet. Um, but, you know, uh, I came up here actually for a beer convention with my cousin. He lives in Ohio and he owns his own brewery. So he is flying to Portland. And I said, hey, I'll meet you up there. And uh, when he was in the beer convention one day, I went and met with a realtor, saw maybe a handful of houses. I found one in Multnomah Village area. And I called my wife and I said, I'm buying a house right now. She never saw it. She's pregnant at the time with my, uh, yeah, my little one. Uh, and she said, do it. And so I bought a house. Um, I 
uh, moved up all of our stuff in a, one of those pods, storage containers. She stayed at home. I unpacked everything, did all the renovations, put all the house together, and oof, maybe a month or so, two months uh, later, uh, my little one was only a couple months old, and so she flew up, and the house is completely set up for her. I even put her clothes away for her, and she's like, this is amazing. It's like going to see a model home, except for everything here is mine. <laughs> and so that's where, that's where it ended up, um, you know. Uh, but, you know, I did miss California. I had the opportunity to work with some really great people there, um, some really um, uh, both artisanal and corporate stuff. In my corporate life, I worked for a restaurant group called Yard House. Uh, there's three of them when I started. Um, I worked at the corporate store, um, and uh, I was a beer trainer. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the owners, there's three owners at that time. Um, the founder, Steele, and then his uh, CFO and uh, the, head, the head chef, um, who were both uh, great people. Um, they kind of decided they never wanted to work again, and so they wanted to beef up their net worth. And so I, um, I didn't travel. I, working in the corporate store, the uh, managers or potential managers for the new stores would be flown to me, and I'd train all the managers. I wrote their training packets um, and set that in there with an awesome team at the time. Um, and then they, uh, I opened up, I think, about 20-ish stores with the managers. Um, they were on, but I just knew that wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, that's why I didn't pursue my business degree. I went to Kelsey at Fullerton. Um, I enjoyed it. I had some great professors there. Um, but I just knew that it wasn't really what I wanted to do. And uh, I wanted to do more of the art you know, of restaurants, because food is an art form, and sometimes when you break it down on a numbers game, it kind of loses the magic. Um, and so I left and went to more artisanal places. Um, I opened up um, another spot, um, and I did pop-ups. I used to guest speak at culinary school in the area, um, you know, amongst other things. But ultimately, uh, you know, I just knew it wasn't the place I wanted to raise my kids, so kind of to backtrack a little bit, I moved up here. I kind of popped around the city a little bit, trying to find my way. I saw some really great places. I staged at some places. But ultimately, there's some places I enjoyed, some places I kind of had a mind meld of like, oh, wow, this is what's going on, uh, you know? But it's no disrespect to them. It's more or less, you know, when we hire someone, and as someone who does the hiring here at Earth and Sea, um, it's not a one-sided, you know, does the employee meet us? It has to be both. And if there's a mutual fit, then you have an exceptional employee. Um, on your hands. And so I kind of bop, bopped around there, um, but ultimately I never really fell in love with anything there. Um, there's some great people there, but ultimately, uh, like I said, it just, I didn't really find it. And, uh, you know, they, when the market was really strong in Portland's real estate um, uh, area, they, uh, they started bulldozing all the woods around our houses to make those three story narrow situations that we see even down in Newburgh and out, you know, I think Lafayette even has some now. And uh, they're knocking the pictures off the walls down in the house and my little, my littlest one uh, uh, couldn't even take her nap. And so my wife's like, we have to move. And at that point I'm like, we're gonna pay four or $500,000 more for the same house we already own. So we're either just gonna grin and bear it or we're gonna get out. And so uh, she was like, well, let's, let's, if you find the property, I'll do it. I, I hit the nail on the head the first time around, so she trusted me. And back then, there's a lot of inventory out in the Willamette Valley. I saw, wow, probably 30 or so properties. And the minute I walked into the one that I currently own, I was like, this is the one. You know, it was, uh, it was turnkey, but it needed some updating. But I look at that as an opportunity to make the space my own while still kind of holding it. Um, it had the old feel to it, so it had some character. Um, the newest part of the house, which is like this giant garage shop that's attached to the house, was probably built in the mid-50s. Um, ironically, my next-door neighbor, his grandfather was the one who lived there prior um, and built that shop. He's, Marvin is probably 94 now. Marvin, uh, uh, you know, uh, was said that it was an old winery, and it actually, you can see it. Um, you know, I try to look up when I had extra time during COVID, the, the history of it, and I found some things, but there are a lot of hand-drawn maps and stuff. Uh, you know, I even I just redid my roof last week and the roof is all still tongue and groove cedar. There's no plywood 
Um, the old brick downstairs is definitely, as someone who studied architecture, uh, is at least 100 years old. And the door is probably four feet wide, as a production door probably would back then. Um, but yeah, so we always think of wine being, you know, 70s and newer, but there was grapes out there at one point, uh, for sure, and there's also orchard trees. Um, so it had all that magic to it, um, but it still wasn't falling apart, which is great, because sometimes the old houses out here take a lineage of good caretakers to make them worthwhile. Um, and we've all seen the ones that unfortunately have passed, and this one is great. Um, so anyways, I bought the property, and I still kind of you know, I was finding my way. Uh, Earth and Sea was brand new um, in 2019 is when they opened, uh, the August. And I interviewed here with Tom and Jordan, who are my two bosses, um, the chef and chef de cuisine. And uh, I had a great time with them. They were great people. Um, but just like any restaurant, you have these ambitions or thoughts that you want to do. And uh, you kind of have to get your sea legs to see if the, the market will let you do that. And uh, one of the things was their opening for lunches. And I had, uh, and they, you know, let me back it up. When you open a restaurant, you really need to be dedicated and being able to be flexible and work on a whim when someone, a new hire doesn't show up or, hey, you know what, we're gonna switch our hours to this or we're gonna try brunch out this week. And I would be doing them a disservice because I knew with this new property, or relatively new, I was there for about a year then, that I knew that I couldn't give them you know, what I would have been happy with. I'm sure, you know, they would have been pretty happy. They're very easygoing and laid back, but at the same time, um, I just felt I was doing a disservice. So I politely declined it, and I continued working at the restaurant I was at the time in Lake Oswego. Um, well, about a, wow, after COVID, the first shutdown, about towards the, you know, I think it was like fall, I saw they had a position for a manager open here. And I kind of, at that point, didn't want to manage anymore. I liked uh, serving. That's what I went back to do at the Lake Oswego place. And that was my first time going back to serving in since I was, tw uh, wow, probably 20 years, no, from a restaurant. Anyways, probably about 15 years of managing. I was like, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna manage. I'm just gonna serve, make my money, go home, and tend to the property because it needs it. Um, but anyways, they, they had a spot open, and I told my wife, I think, I. I think I'm gonna go for a managing again. I might be crazy, but I really enjoyed Tom and Jordan. And uh, I walked in and they were like, welcome back. <laughs> they hired me uh, pretty much on the spot. They were very stoked. I was stoked. Um, they, uh, the subsequent um, kind of uh, people that were in my realm did a great job. Uh, but you know, from what Tom kind of described, he wanted to, he kind of found his niche a little bit with the food and wanted to really accent the front of house and uh, bring it up. Um, and so I did that. And then a week later, I lost my job because COVID happened again in November. So <laughs> I didn't know if I even had a job anymore because I just gave up a place I was at for about three years um, and was making good money and relatively happy at to work at a place that now um, literally like five days later um, got shut down again. So I kind of bothered Tom, like, can I do anything? And he's like, well, you can come in and help clean up the bar. You can, you know, pop through here and there. But, you know, we had the ice storm in that February, and, like, one of these trees fell over. So I was like, I'll bring my chainsaw and cut up your tree for you. And, yeah, it was like, you know, that's what I did. I, I just did weird, odd jobs just to keep myself relevant um, and uh, let them know I still wanted to be here, you know. And, you know, in February, they're like, we're going to reopen. And I was like... Awesome, I'm, I have a job again. Uh, and so that rest was kind of history. I kind of, you know, took what my predecessors did and kind of put my own spin on it and uh, um, went from there until what you see today. You know, and currently, uh, like I spoke about earlier, I do everything front of house from uh, the bar program um, and the wine program is a giant um, uh, aspect of that to the more boring stuff like schedules. Um, you know, I was, you know, equally um, as proud as my front house team as I am the wine list and the cocktail list. The front house team here is exceptional. We have, um, uh, with the exception of maybe, uh, like my wife worked here a little bit. She also um, works at uh, DeJory. Um, she manages there, but uh, you know, um, I uh, took her for a few days a week here because she's excellent at what she does. 
and uh, Tom's sister-in-law also worked here, but both of them have kind of gone, kind of went on their own career path. But um, aside for those two, we've only lost one front house employee in the, oh wow, almost three years I've been here, which is a hard thing to do in this industry, especially when you're in Carleton. Um, the staff here is uh, very competent. They all bring their own persona to the table, but I don't micromanage them. I let them do them. You know, and if they need guidance, I'm always here. But um, I'm very proud of the the team that we've curated here, uh, and uh, you know, just as much as the wine list, like I said, in the, the bar. It's covered a lot. I got a lot of I got a lot of questions. We're gonna back up. Yeah, so tell me about initial restaurant experience. What was the first thing you did in a restaurant? Wow, I started in restaurants when I was 14, and I am 41 now. I'll be 42 in a couple months. Um, I've never stopped. Um, I had some side jobs to, you know, break, break the, uh, uh, what's the word? Monot I don't want to say monotony because that means it sounds boring, but just break it up a little bit. We'll just <laughs> keep it there. Um, I worked ironically in Backhouse. I did uh, dishwashing and prep, and then they let me work cold line. Um, and um, I did that at a, like a family-owned pizza spot. Um, I started serving when I was 17 because you could then. I don't know what it is. It's, it's, <laughs> the rules change crazy. I, you know, I think 18 now. But um, And once again, at a, a Mexican food spot that was also family owned um, and um, went on from there. But that's where it started. And ironically, I started back house and went to front house. And our chef owner, Tom, started front house and he <laughs> had a back house. So we kind of crossed paths in a minute. But that's where it started at. Um, after the Mexican food um, spot that I was family owned is when I went to Yard House, and I was 21 at that time. So tell me about that about that shift. That's an interesting shift. So what was that like going from kind of family owned into that world? Uh, it was a lot. It was overwhelming. I mean, the training packet at that time uh, was probably harder than my accounting final. It was a giant packet. They wanted you to know the, all the aspects of how beer is made and, and you know, very intricate, you know, details. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but in hitting maybe your target market as servers and uh, the average age was there was probably 21 to 23. Um, most of us in school. Um, uh, it was a little overwhelming. It's very corporate in the structure. You had to memorize everything. I, uh, I, you know, it wasn't even the final that was hard. It was everything from beginning to end. But it really taught me a, a lot more professionalism um, in this industry, mm -hmm. um, as far as you know, expectations. You know, at the Mexican food place, my only expectation was to memorize number one through 32. <laughs> the combos, I still know them. Uh, sadly enough, I don't remember people's names on a regular basis, but if you want to ask me what 15 is, I'll tell you it's the Huevos Rancheros. Uh, and you have to ask them what kind of tortillas they want. Uh, but that being said, is um, that was a giant shift. Um, and it was almost just as much as a giant shift of uh, the subsequent to Yard House, going from that ultra um, corporate aspect to the artisanal aspect, you know? Uh, but on that note with the training packets, that's why when I became the corporate trainer there, the first thing I did was rewrite those training packets. Because it's good to know how beer is made, um, but it shouldn't be three chapters worth um, to your servers because no one's going to sit down on their table and say, before I order this Pilsner, what kind of, you know, what was the fermentation process? It was a big spot and even though we had 250 handles on that I knew every single one, uh, our most popular beer is still Coors Light. It was kind of the ongoing joke. You get some people who would just be like, oh, just give me the most popular one. and I'd send them out of Coors Light, and they're like, what's this? I'm like, there you go. And that's, I mean, that's Orange County in a nutshell. There's some good people <laughs> who know who are giant nerds, but there's also an, a level of comfortability people enjoy. And that's why, you know, those chain restaurants thrive there. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's the way that we all make business. Um, but uh, subsequent to Yard House, once again, going to the artisanal place that was a little more loose, like the family on spot, um, but definitely, you know, I was. 25, 26 then, definitely a different way of life. Uh, working till well into three in the morning, um, hosting parties, you know, uh, I 
don't want to say the restaurant, but we definitely would close down the shades. And we had some random flamenco dancers that came through, and the GM at the time would just tell me to host host a party, Drew, and I would host a party. And that's where I really actually got that element of to get out of the rigidness that corporate did, uh, corporate set for me. You know, it let me know the expectations of knowledge and professionalism, but at the same time, to really host a party and, and bring it in and come out at four in the morning and be like, that was absolutely amazing and not be resentful that I had to work that late or be tired and ready to work the next shift at 10 a.m. because someone called out sick, bring it on. Uh, that was excellent. And there I was a lead server um, and to kind of go a little bit more in detail, sorry if I'm going on a tangent, but after that, the GM of um, that would tell me to host parties opened up his own place in an artist village in Santa Ana, and he said, you know, I was the lead trainer there, or one of the trainers, I should say, and uh, he's like, I want you to open this new place with me, and I was like, all right, Jerry, we can do that, you know, and Jerry uh, taught me a lot. He uh, was exceptional at business and his interpersonal communication was a little crazy at times. I get calls as late as 4.30 in the morning not wanting to know product mixes and numbers and he, if you guys uh, ever read Kitchen Confidential, um, which is the holy grail in my opinion, he made me actually read that before I worked with him. <laughs> cover to cover is brand new then. Chapter 9 is Bigfoot. He was very much like Bigfoot, um, but I respect him a lot. Um, but. Um, uh, anyways, he brought me there and I still kind of would train at the, the original spot and then at night I would leave and drive down the highway and I would paint the walls of this new place and it was an old 1920s building so we, he, he had this great vision of making it like a little Spanish bar. It was dark, mostly candlelit, um, it was no signage, we had six tables inside, four tables outside and two communals and we had People like uh, Jed Apatow was came through, and a lot of band members uh, and uh, uh, actors, actresses, sports. I think they liked it because it was dark and quiet, no reservations. You just showed up, and it was food comes out when it's ready. The menu might change tomorrow. I don't know. It was on a, in an old building, like I said, so there's no gas. It was all electric. And what our chef Lou could do on a flat top the size of two of these tables pushed together, all electric, was absolutely incredible. Fidela, our uh, sous chef, was amazing. She is from Oaxaca. She is probably four foot eight. We had to put a step stool in front of the, some of the uh, prep tables and, uh, the, you know, she wanted to reach some things. Um, but it was magic. And that's what taught me to curate a great team because that team there was unsurpassed. Um, and so I, once I you know, got that up and running, I let the first place go and I was the GM at that place. That was my first management. I went from uh, like a corporate server trainer to a GM um, and that's when I started curating wine lists as well. Um, and the wine uh, lists there were different, um, definitely a lot more old world involved. Um, nothing over on the list, $70. That's what he wanted. He wanted the European feel. He's like, your job is to find great wine at you know this price point. It's easy to find good wine that's on our list at you know three, $400, but find a great mind-blowing wine that's not gonna cost the restaurant more than 20 and change a bottle. Go for it. And that was awesome. I had a great time and a great learning experience doing that. Um, and uh, it was unsurpassed. And so that's that. Those shifts, and you know, kind of to touch on the original question, those shifts were giant for me because the shift from the mom and pop to corporate was just as big as the shift to the next place, uh, which was called Habana, which is in the lab in Costa Mesa. If anyone knows it. And then from Habana, I went to Lola Gaspar, and that was the small place. And those shifts all really formed a, a lineage of what my mindset is today. So you mentioned that was the, the first time you were curating a wine list. At what point did wine sort of become into your consciousness? At Habana. Um, I was not the wine buyer there, but that was, um, um, once again, more Spanish-driven, where we did actual tastings. I mean, at Yard House, it's... Big, big house stuff. It's forgettable, and I'm not selling any wine at 
a Mexican food place. Uh, I sell margaritas there. And so it was at Havana um, to really kind of get your palate tuned in to what it is and to, you know, both read, you know, the tech sheet, drink it, and have someone who was educated or wine bar at the time, who was Jerry, tell you what you're, what you're supposed to. You know, those kind of three aspects really hit home. And that's when wine um, really became on the forefront. And that's when beer took the back seat. Um, you know, and don't get me wrong, I love curating bar programs, but I'm not a, a huge hard alcohol drinker. I probably drink more for work, actually not probably. I definitely drink more for work than I ever do in my free time, which sounds odd, but it's the way it is. Uh, <laughs> I drink more in these four walls than I have in the pre previous three years in my house or five years or whatever. So tell me about stepping up into that kind of role of building a wine list then at, 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 at the bar uh, and having that challenge of it has to be good wine, but it has to be at X amount of price. Um, how did you set out into the world of wine to, to find that list? Well, um, Jerry, uh, who was my boss at the time and the guy who brought me over, um, did an excellent job of having me sit in on his wine meetings from the beginning. And I saw how he manage those, both in what he liked, how he had read the book. Uh, he was to the, I can't, to say he's blunt is an understatement. He just like, this is garbage. And he'd just throw it on the ground or he would just be able slide it. He's like, why would you bring me that stuff? Like he, so I might not be that uh, <laughs> straightforward, uh, but I do lose friends sometimes if I don't like their wine and I, it's no disrespect on a personal level, but business and personal are vastly different uh, for me. And, uh, but, you know, I, I kind of saw what it, he wanted and the wine list was not big. He just wanted it to be updated. He wanted to show it a thumb on the pulse. Um, you know, I, I'm talking maybe 12 to 15 wines. But he's like, you know, he, him and I are big baseball guys. So he, and he called me Drew all the time. He's the only guy who ever called me Drew. Drew, every single thing needs to be a home run. Every single thing. You have a small list. I don't want anything that is ho-hum. If it's not a home run, get it off my list. Don't waste my money. And yeah, uh, I would delve into books. I would do an educated guess and ask, you know, of like what I enjoyed, what sold, you know, and, and ask my reps to bring it. Sometimes, you know, I'd let them just bring what they wanted to. Uh, generally, it's a smattering of both. Um, but in this world of restaurants, it's not just what's good, it's does it make sense? Is it selling? What's the price point? You know, uh, those are aspects that I think a lot of people forget, you know, and to touch on that here at Earth and Sea, our, our wine storage is tiny. The storage in my house is probably 10 times larger than the storage here by far. Um, and I have that I still have the, the thumb on the pulse. I drink them all. I rotate regularly. We print the wine list once a week, um, both glass pour and long list. Um, just because it's on the long list this week doesn't mean it's going to be here tomorrow. Um, but there needs to be an aspect of sales, and that's a big thing um, for me. It's not only is it good, but is it going to sell? You know, I have some Chateau Cheval Blanc at 1500 a bottle. I don't intend to sell that, but I will sling Petty Green Old Vine, Anderson Family, um, Tricetum, uh, DuPont. I will sell those regularly through and through, um, and they all have their story. And uh, once again, it comes down to the sales aspect. Is it marketable and sellable? Um, you know, the 100 Sun stuff I can't keep in. Uh, the Cameron and Thomas, you know, as far as the old guard, you can't keep those in, you know, and even the bigger houses that I might carry here are here for a reason, you know. Uh, I brought in some of the bigger houses when I came here, it was all s small producers driven, and that is a great concept, but unfortunately, we're not all from here, and so sometimes if the bottle is triple digits in any aspect, but you have a couple in from, you know, maybe you know, Midwest or even East Coast, it's just something that's irrelevant for them. It's really hard for them to eat a cost at that price point without having some type of uh, uh, unsettling kind of uh, mindset. 
And so the idea, though, is like, for example, Druin. I love Druin. If you don't like a Druin Loren, I can't help you. Uh, but you know, from them, we have uh, the Cuvée 13. So we get a big house, but we have the Cuvée 13, which is a one-off bottle. Of, are you familiar with that? Yes. So we have two bottles left of it. So if someone wants an insane bottle, but they want it to be a relevant producer, but something special, that's the idea. So there's some of that you know, uh, in, in here. So everything has its time and place. And um, vintages and price points are spread out just the same. So there's, you know, a, a wide variety. Even though my Pinot list is generally all Oregon, there's definitely some Mayo Camazé in there and some French producers like uh, uh, Joseph Druin. And then occasionally I'll throw a Californian in there just because, uh, why not? But it's <laughs> few and far between. Um, but once again, they all have their marketability and uh, there's their own story. And you know, uh, as we get, you know, every year we get more and more true wine nerds, and most of them have never been here, but they're so educated on what we have. They know producers and AVAs and vintage variations and stuff like that. And it's absolutely amazing. And I've said this a couple times to some, you know, uh, owners and, and winemakers, and uh, that I've been fortunate enough to host here uh, that. Thank you. Like you guys are really elevating the overall industry here. Just every year, I see more and more true wine geeks here, and it's only because of people like them, um, you know. And so my job is just to try and accent that on the restaurant side. So I'm curious, in your, in your, from your perspective, as you were starting starting to build wine lists, and of course, I've been building them for a while. What did you find excited you about a wine uh, that you were that you were thinking about, considering for a list, and what did you find excites customers? What, 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 what are the most exciting aspects of a, of a wine? Once again, I'm going to go back on the food. Um, it's just, what excites me is when the, the wine list um, and the food meld, both in quality and price point and flavor. You know, like here we do a lot of oysters and seafood. So, um, Milan, you know, is exciting. A lot of people, um, you know, who are coming from out of state or overseas don't aren't as maybe knowledgeable as the Milan aspect that's here. I mean, Milan and oysters on you know warm summer day when generally everyone's here is absolutely amazing. That's exciting to me to get someone to try something new, um, you know, uh, that they haven't heard of and are excited about it. And then better yet. Um, they wave me down and say, where can I go get this? You know, it's it's that food aspect and kind of like as I touched on in that story is that people getting others excited about it or to educate someone else about something that they haven't heard of and sh also have a, a share with them um, something that excites me, you know. Uh, you know, I had someone buy one of the Cameron Julia Pinos the other day. I like Cameron. I think his wines are excellent, and namely his Chardonnay program is one of my top five. Uh, but the Julia is uh, not an everyday drinker from him, from the Abbey Ridge Farm. It, he never doesn't make it every every vintage. And I had a table, I just put it on the list, I had a table um, actually from Eugene came up the other day, and they've never heard of it, and they were like, we want to get this. And the minute he took a sip, he's like, wow. And to me, I was like, that's, my job is done. If someone's gonna pay, um, the price point for that, and without a second thought, be so excited about the wine as well. Um, my job is completely done. And I, you know, the downfall of him is a, when he asks me where he can go buy it. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, but generally I send him to Andrew at Valley Wine Merchant in Newburgh. Andrew's a great guy. He has very fair price points, um, and he has an exceptional. Um, quality uh, of wines that he uh, has in his shop as well as just uh, having a great relationship with a lot of local producers and I mean I still shop there um, uh, because I like knowing that my money is going to go to a great person and so uh, just like with wine it's sometimes nice to you know slide that card or throw cash and you know once in know it's going to go to uh, high quality people at the end of the day. You didn't send up to knock on John Paul's door? <laughs> yeah, I don't think, uh, don't, don't uh, go knock on his door, please. <laughs> uh, don't tell him Andy sent you, please. Uh, I will not be allowed back. But, but yeah, he's, I, him and uh, uh, T 
Terry are both a- exceptional people, and uh, Tom and Phil over there are always um, very uh, welcoming as well. So uh, that's a great crew they have over there. Tell me about developing uh, sort of a notion or a philosophy of hospitality. What 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 do, what is hospitality in your mind, and how has your sort of how has that evolved as you've evolved? That's a good question. Uh, because I think that there's a lot of places that forgot the art of hospitality. I think a lot of people, um, and I shouldn't say people, restaurant businesses um, have almost the, sometimes they don't get it, but they have the almost the aura of you're bothering them or we're, no, we're not going to do this, um, which is the opposite of hospitality. Um, it's it's just that. I treat this place like if you were to go to my house. If, if you guys came to my house, I would just leave you at the front door and act like you're annoying me. I'd say, come on in. And if I was busy, I'd say, hey, come in really quick. I got to put my dogs away or whatever it is, or I'm just wrapping this up. Grab a drink, help yourself, take a seat. I'll be right with you, you know, and then come in and when I'm done doing what I'm doing and high five. But, um, you know, I think that a lot of people forget that aspect. And there's no difference if you were to walk into my house than if you were to walk in with, to Earth and Sea. You know, um, that, you know, there's some people who apologize for ordering a steak mid well or well done. Well, that's sad to me, actually. And I go, why are you apologizing? Oh, the last place, you know, I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. Like, you know, would I order it that way? No, but that's not. That, that's what you like, so why would you apologize, you know? Or, you know, occasionally we have people with allergies or the, the infamous gluten-free, who cares? As long as they're happy and we can accommodate, absolutely. You know, and that's why I like working with Tom and Jordan. I work with the chefs, you ask them for, you know, oh, I have a vegan, and they act, you know, huff and puff and might even give me an earful, and that's ridiculous. We're here, they'll do anything. Oh, you want your pasta with only shrimp? Absolutely. You want us to add something on there? We have it in the house. Why not? We have it here. And, you know, there's, there's kind of the aspect that people have lost. I think COVID kind of did a number, um, both with at the beginning on both the guest side and, and restaurant worker side. Everyone was just grateful to be out. And then it went the opposite, kind of, where then everyone was like, oh my God, whether it be restaurant workers burnt out because it was a complete circus, right, when the doors opened, to, you know, now there's people who are once grateful, well, why, why do we have to wait? Or why can't you fit another table here? Well, it's because we have distancing, you know, or why can't I sit at the bar? We, we, we can't, you know, and it's, you know, unfortunately bring, on the restaurant level, we're the ones who get the earful, even though obviously we're not making the laws, but it kind of went from like this, one aspect, complete 180 to the other aspect, and now it's kind of coming back. But, um, you know, uh, in the world of hospitality, while I learned a lot, I don't think my personal philosophy has ever changed. Um, it just let me know what I can get away with and what I can do, um, both on the good side and, and you know, and, and bad side. But to be a good diplomat is kind of um, there. You have to, you know, sometimes give people knows um, and uh, you just kind of have to try and do your best. Can you please everyone know? You know, uh, and unfortunately in my position, I'm saying no to people are cutting them off a lot more than the servers. I have no problem doing that. I'd rather the servers uh, not have that awkward moment, but there's some people who are like, you know what, you're right. I've actually had enough, uh, you know, like that uh, colada is showing inside. Uh, has a good amount of rum in there and one lady had about four in an hour, and we said, hey, we should probably let you, let those catch up. And 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, she's like, thank you so much. And I was like, hey, I know it's gonna happen to you. Uh, where some people I cut off and, you know, uh, they have the uh, infamous, uh, you know how old I am, or I can always do this, or the my favorite, I never get drunk, like, okay. And you just gotta smile, nod, and do I make people upset? Yes, but, you still have to kind of stick by your guns and, and, and hold, you know, yourself accountable to make sure your job is done correctly. So can you please them all? No. Um, but being hospitable is always a thing. It will never change. And even if they freak out on me and happen to walk in, which has definitely happened a week later where I, I'll never be back and a week later I see them again. No, no problem. We all have our moments. Sit down and please 
you know, if you're ready to go, we can definitely open that bottle of wine or, you know, or do whatever. But it's no, you know, it, it's nothing more than me just doing my job. Tell me about what kind of role education plays for you when it comes to, you have, you've created this wine list. Obviously, it's designed to go with the food in the restaurant. What role is sort of educating your customers play? How, 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 much do you, how much time do you spend telling people this is the wine or this is the people you want to buy from? Or, you know, how, how far down the rabbit hole do you go with, with your customers? Uh, I mean, it's gone down rabbit holes uh, for sure. It's whether, um, you know, it's reading the guests. If they want to go down a rabbit hole and I have the time, I will go down the rabbit hole uh, all the way to the core. Uh, but at the same time, there's an element that I'm a one-man show in a lot of aspects here. Um, uh, you know, if we have even special events and stuff like that, sometimes someone calls and I'm in the middle of it and I have to go take a call and it's just politely excusing yourself. Um, but uh, I've done, you know, at the very least, it, started, it starts with, you know, hey, quick snippets of this is the wine flavor profile and in the world of sales once again I can't get into the overly um, uh, lengthy kind of notes on your pa on your nose and aromas versus palate and it's like uh, I gotta keep it short and concise it's still sales um, and uh, um, this will be awesome with the food walk away have the server even open it sometimes I don't have time check back with them, how is everything. It can be as simple as that to, I give people homework on a regular basis, like we're, we're staying out here and this is, you know, we have this one place ske uh, uh, scheduled and where else would you go? You know, I'm like, oh, of that one place, I like this Pinot is showing awesome, this vintage is showing awesome, go, you know, give this person a high five and tell me Andy said hello. Uh, you know, uh, versus me writing a list and saying, hey, you know, I go here, 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 and here. Um, I've even called um, uh, winemakers or uh, tasting managers at home in the restaurant hours and said, hey, can you fit these people in tomorrow at 11? Um, and that's definitely happened. And reversely, a lot of wineries will do the same. They'll text me, um, even Dan from Shea the other day, hey, I got some great people coming through. And they showed up, they had a great time. Um, and I'm very grateful for the relationship that I have with a lot of some of the, uh, a lot of the wineries and some of the best uh, 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 quality wines in my opinion in the country um, so it kind of can go that gambit you know there's even sometimes you catch me on a slow Monday I'll open a bottle for you and let's drink it together and at the same time um, whether it be educating the guests or even the staff we open up bottles regularly here Tom um, trust me um, to open stuff up and yeah do I clear some of the higher end ones with them obviously uh, but you know uh, we've done some you know verticals of three four five of uh, some Freedom Hill stuff uh, by uh, from Ken Wright across the street just to say hey look at guys let's just drink these and see you tell me what you're drinking you know or Nicholas J. Pauley dinner they gifted me uh, like a 95 Mayo Camise for hosting them which is beyond generous for Jay and Galen and Chris and Jill and all that that crew over there um, and it's, what I did is I opened it at the end of the service because every staff member should try a high quality Burgundian Pinot with that age on it because it's a Pinot that ruins other Pinots and that's not going to be something that you know they might ever try so instead of taking it home and you know having it with you know at dinner with maybe some friends everyone should try that everyone should try that bottle and then I Googled the price just to see, and I, yeah, it was definitely worth that price point, but it was something I probably won't be purchasing soon. Uh, but is it worth it? Absolutely. Um, I just have, uh, um, I have two daughters actually, my oldest is 16, so I have two kids that, you know, for every dollar I make, I keep a nickel type thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the education aspect uh, gives me a level of fulfillment, um, whether it be the guest or the, or the uh, uh, staff. We'll talk about the other other part of your wine life right now, or your oyster grape life. Uh, yeah. Tell us, tell us about about how yesternight has has uh, grown up from from its original purchase. When we bought the property, I didn't intend to necessarily put grapes out there. I just took it all in. I'm like, I went from you know a normal cul-de-sac lot in Southwest Portland to this you know a property in, in Colorado. We had 40 acres, so it's not foreign to me, but. Um, I didn't own that, I was a child, so uh, <laughs> that being said is now I was, you know, taking it in and, you know, we, 
looked at this house that's you know also a good size and we looked at this property and I've always been a plant nerd um, at uh, one of the restaurant concepts I grew plants on the roof so they're um, you know in the middle of like an urban environment um, every house I've ever owned had edible plants a lot of them were containered because I lived in a uh, place <laughs> without a backyard but uh, all aspects you know uh, of um, kind of how to grow and so now um, I got that you know even in my Portland house we had a decent backyard but I dug I bought six 33 gallon uh, trash cans and I uprooted some fruit trees that I planted I'm like I'm taking these with me and I shoved them in there and on a giant nerd level I even did one and I put a bunch of compost because I was like I'm not losing my my compost to start I wanted something to like be the mother if you will uh, for my new pile that's uh, so I, I I looked at the movers and I said can you move these and at first they said we don't move um, live things and I said what if I just stick it in the back and you don't look at it and he's like okay and so he did it but um, I kind of took it all in um, and you know I really got into you know so put those trees in the ground did some big Hugel mounds um, which I enjoy that um, style of planting and, and, and gardening um, you know and was able to do some aspects of you know like the snap peas I grow will come here a lot of the berries and when I grow go to the bar program um, and so I was able to kind of fulfill a mini dream of growing things and then making them into things and having other people enjoy it um, yesterday was a term that my littlest one used and I didn't actually know as a word but it is uh, that she used to, instead of saying yesterday she'd say yesternight and she was about three and had that toddler voice and it was very endearing and uh, that's where that name came from. And I watched the way the wind patterns were and, and where the water set. And uh, we're just about like the bottom of the property is like 840 in elevation. The top is about 900 plus. Um, and I just, I would time lapse the property and just watch it like an idiot. And I was like, you know, like I think, I think it'll work. But I didn't tell my wife, and just like the houses, I said, hey, I called her up from the nursery and said, hey, I just bought um, a lot of Chardonnay vines. <laughs> and I rented a U-Haul, and I put them in a U-Haul and drove them all to my property, and I um, had a busboy I worked with at the time who I gave him side money, and the busboy and I unloaded all these grapevines because, of course, my house is high up it's on the top and the vineyard is on this kind of has like a, a hillside and there's a little wash and then there's like this bump and so we planted it way down on the bump which is like 400 yards away and I was like oh man that's that's a that's a ways to go up and down so luckily one of my neighbors who um, didn't have anything on their on their property yet and was once part of our property got parceled off a while ago let us pull the u-haul kind of across their property and there's no fence line and we just dumped them right there on the ground and said okay well these are going to go in and uh don't get me wrong i prepped the ground first ahead of time and stuff because uh, i knew what i was doing my wife just thought i was out there on the tractor doing weird things but it was already cleared and squared and i dumped about 30 pounds of organic compost and just surface tilled it so it wasn't like I just dug up dirt. They had horses and cows down there pre previous, so waiting a, a year and change um, definitely helped not make, make the ground more uh, suitable mm -hmm. and let it, you know, all that hot manure kind of break down. Um, and so, yeah, I looked at the spot and I thought it was actually a great spot for Chardonnay. Um, and I did it all myself. Um, I dug a hole. I wish I could tell you I had an auger, but I didn't. I literally had a shovel and dug every hole by hand and the trellis wasn't in yet so I got grade stakes and baling twine and would stretch it out um, and then every five feet I just put a little electrical tape piece stretch it out and tied it and then I just dug every time I saw electrical tape and we used that as a template and stepped it down um, it's about an acre maybe a little under because um, I knew if I did more than that it wouldn't be done the right way um, and it's not about the quantity, it's about the quality for me. I really don't ever envisioning, or ever envision us having more than 
two, maybe three acres at tops, given kind of where the the area I enjoy for them are, is. Um, but yeah, so we kind of did that. Uh, and we do all the pruning and shoot thinning. Um, Jessica Cortell, who is um, grown to be a really um, great friend, um, gives me some pointers here and there when I bother her, but I try not to because she is very busy and she doesn't care about an acre. Well, I'm sure she does, but <laughs> it's a lot. It's, it's, you know, it's the garnish on her uh, entree, so to speak. There's a lot bigger things for her to do. So I try not to bother her too much. Every once in a while, I'll call and say, can I borrow your undervine cultivator or something if I'm not putting the sheep out there? Um, but ultimately, that was, a, that was the, the idea, and it will only be Chardonnay. Um, it's a great high elevation sh uh, site for it. About 100 yards to the east with a natural spring pond that pops up. And it's, when I say pond, it's, it's a good pond. It's a California lake, uh, I'd say. Uh, but it has a, great, a lot of great aspects to the property. You know, It's not just, oh, I'm in Willamette Valley uh, or a Shehala Mountains for us. Every, you know, let's put grapes out there. You know, all, all sites aren't created equal, especially on Shehala Mountains. Um, but it was something that kind of was that blend of the old me putting uh, plants on the roof of my restaurant and my love for wine, and it melded together. And it's always the learning curve. Even in restaurants, you still learn. Uh, one of my um, favorite professors in business. Um, he's the head of business, uh, the, the head of the business department, but he still took a, a class every semester as a student. So he said, it's audacious of me to ever think I could stop learning. And that is completely correct. I still read and educate myself in the world of restaurants. And if you're ever complacent, that's when you're going to fail. And so um, I am far from um, being complacent in the world of growing grapes. Um, but at the same time, um, the idea is to grow a very small plot with, that's intentional and give my grapes to someone who's going to make something awesome because I am definitely not a winemaker. I appreciate what they do. I understand it, but that's not how my brain works. So I don't care how much reading I did or how much education I did. Me, on my best day, would be an average, C, uh, average winemaker on like a C minus day. I just... You know, what's the point of me putting all this effort into grapes to only kind of ruin it at the end of the day? So, uh, yeah, my grapes sold back in January, um, and this is the first harvest of them, so I'm very uh, grateful. Um, you know, uh, there's actually a few people, I, um, you know, that were looking at them, um, and I said, first person to say, I want them, and give me a check, it's theirs. I'm not here to pit people against each other. I'm not that type of person. And, uh, they got sold, and I subsequently some other people were maybe a little bummed because they were hoping to get it. Uh, but once again, I guess that's a good problem to have. Um, but the idea is, once these are online, is to put down the next plot. And once again, it wouldn't be any larger than an acre, um, with the same reasoning. Mm -hmm. Why Chardonnay? Uh, Chardonnay is funny. Uh, <laughs> Chardonnay was the first wine tasting I despised in California. <laughs> I hated it, especially if I worked at a place, like I worked at a place in Laguna Beach that had like a happy hour um, to get maybe those tourists from the hotels to come over. Happy hour price point, California Chardonnay is some of the worst wine I've ever had in my life. Um, and I'm sorry, once again, business and personal, so if you're a California winemaker, you made stuff at that price point, no disrespect, but it's disgusting. Uh, it's like, um, this oak bomb, so heavy and so weighty. I don't care what you're eating. You can't taste anything beyond it. Some are so buttery. I was like, I'd rather dip my crab legs in this than try and consume it as wine. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's some great producers. Like right now, I have Chateau Montalene on our list. So, you know, and, and, and so there's some great ones out there. So um, not to, no disrespect to them. It's just, uh, especially at that price point, it was rough. Um, and... So there's that aspect of, I came here and I had Oregon Chardonnay and I can't, without sit dropping uh, an F-bomb on this interview, I was like, F yes, this is, this is what it's supposed to be. This is it. And it can be done. Uh, it was excellent. Um, it rejuvenated my love for that, uh, for wine in the world of Chardonnay. Um, and 
uh, so on a personal level, there's that aspect, and on a um, more functional level, high elevation Chardonnay, um, it's organic. Uh, we we stopped tilling this year. Um, to, we think the vines are good to go no till, um, and so um, with the with the exception of those buzzwords, um, it's just it's a beautiful site that lends itself to make great Chardonnay. Um, we don't use any herbicides or anything like that. We literally, like when I was just doing my shoot thinning, um, my partner or wife, whatever term you prefer, um, and I um, literally were hand pulling everything uh, around the bases of every single one. Um, you know, uh, it's an element of going back and enjoying, you know, what's down there, you know, aside from, you know, the obvious co-planting and the, the mushrooms that grow down there. There's frogs in there. I regularly harbor snakes down there. I love them. I have no problem with snakes. They do a great job. And I don't care how much you dis dislike snakes. I'll see one snake over 100 gophers, voles, and mice. So do it all day long. Um, we don't poison, do any poison or sulfur bombs. I'm kind of old school. Uh, I use a 22 because uh, I can't do a cinch trap to save my life. So I'll sit out there with my dog and we'll get some gophers. Um, I like to harbor a lot of the kestrels and um, uh, birds of prey. We had a bobcat down there named Louie uh, that lived down there for a while. Um, he has moved on, uh, but Louie was very obvious because Louie was a slate gray bobcat. These bright green eyes from 300 yards away, you could see him, he's massive. And you go down there and hunt. Some of my neighbors who are maybe of an older school think I'm crazy because I let the coyotes pass through and they hunt too. And they're like, why wouldn't you want to take them down with your sheep and goats? And I was like, well, they never look twice at my sheep, goats, or chickens. Uh, they're 400 yards away from the from the house, the closest spot. They're doing a great job. There's even uh, my my sheep breeder, um, the, which is at Bidawi Farms over on Top and Cockins. I love them. They're great people. Um, uh, I have a standing uh, invitation to go into their barn because uh, they have resident barn owls, um, and I will sit in that stuffy barn and crawl up to the lofts and get owl pellets. Um, and collect them and then throw those through my vineyard. It scares away the gophers. I think there's a, I'll shove it down the, down the holes so they think there's an owl in the area. And it suppresses them. Is it an end all be all? No. But if you hit a lot of different aspects, it's just one more great one. And adds a little bit of extra calcium and whatnot to, to the vines, you know. But there's, a, you know, there's an element that it's, you know, uh, a lot of people have like this uh, almost romanticized version of what a, they're going to do on a natural level and they realize that it's not really realistic. Um, but there is a happy medium and there's also the reason why I don't want a large vineyard. I can't get away with stuff like that. I'd have to compromise maybe some of my principles or thoughts. And I enjoy staying true to the, to the game. And even one acre with just myself and uh, Susan um, just uh, uh, is a lot of work. Um, and she's now switched her schedule, so she's working more days where she used to be more nights, so it's literally just me five days a week. Uh, and generally the, the way it goes is I wake up and I get the animals out, my kids off to school, and then I immediately change and go outside until about an hour I have to be here. I run inside, smash food in my face, take a shower, and I work until about midnight. And that's my everyday kind of schedule. Yeah. A labor of love. What? A labor of love. It is. It is. Uh, but, you know, it's, I was just talking to uh, um, one of the servers here, and is it, is it exhausting? Yeah, it's, it is physical work. But mentally, it's not work at all. You know, there's that old, like, you know, love what you do, you know, don't work a day in your life. And well, that's kind of like a cliche state, statement. It's kind of true. You know, like, am I tired at the end of the day from doing squats, you know, uh, 1,100, 1,200 times to, you know, go down and bend and, and pick back up and pull. Yeah, obviously, yeah, it's tiring. You know, yesterday I did shoot thinning, repaired a sheep fence, uh, cleaned a chicken coop, you know, amongst other things. We just got our roof done. So uh, our house is surrounded by um, edibles. So there's about 600 strawberries down and we have current and ras uh, three different kinds of raspberries. I'm breeding a white, a white Blackberry right now that my wife signed me up for, um, and everyone assumes blackberries will take over everything. No, no, not these ones that she picked out. It was like twenty dollars for maybe these little two-inch at best little sticks. 
And I was like, what'd you get me? She's like, we're gonna do these white blackberries. They're from like the 1800s on the Eastern Seaboard. And they, you know, okay, okay. And so I looked at, like I looked them up and it's like ease of growth, zero out of five. Everyone's like, oh, ours, you know, like I just try and read reviews because there's always someone who's more educated than yourself. And so maybe someone who's educated will give me some insight. Oh no, everyone's like, oh, ours died in a week. Uh, this, that, and the other. So I put them in uh, wine barrels that I cut in half and, uh, uh, they're four now. I just kept chopping them down to grow the core, and this year they're going to fruit. They actually have just starting to put some uh, something on there right now, so I'm pretty excited about that. But the idea is you can just walk around our house and just eat, um, and you can. Uh, and it's both of native and local stuff, but also a lot of stuff that I've planted or curated once again with intention. Yeah. But it is a it is a labor of love. I am I'm tired. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, back to the the sort of the the restaurant game for a second. You mentioned earlier the the kind of first time working with a team, building a team, and kind of understanding the the importance of having that. So tell me about building the team here specifically. You mentioned low turnover despite all of the challenges of of, of the space here. So how how do you build a team? What do you look for? And then once you have people in place, what is the sort of the key for you, in your mind for keeping them happy and functional? Um, well, Earth and Sea specifically, when I came here, there was a big turnover of people who were here who didn't come back, um, with the exception of, was it maybe three? Um, and all three are awesome. I didn't, I, you know, are they super high-end wine nerds? No, but they care about their job. Uh, I can't teach that. I could teach you anything you uh, want to hear, but I can't teach you to care. And so, you know, uh, when I'm hiring somebody, you know, I got the gist of where they're from and their experience looking on paper. I don't need to ask them anything really about their previous experience. I can get all that I want to know. I want to have a conversation with them. I rarely look at their resume during an interview. Uh, for a couple of reasons. A, I want, I'm a decent read of people. Um, my wife hates it because a lot of times I can tell her when she's mad when she doesn't understand it. Uh, <laughs> why? Uh, she's, it drives her nuts. Uh, and uh, uh, she can't really try and put on a face and keep a cigarette, if you will, when trying to like uh, tell me she's not mad or frustrated when she is or vice versa. Um, so anyways, um, you know, I, I kind of read the person and I kind of rely on maybe just some intuition on that. Um, and I want to see if they can have a conversation with me because if we can have a conversation and have a great time and high five when it's done, you could do that with anyone who comes in here. Um, and, you know, it's nice to know kind of what their level of knowledge is. So I need a, I don't want to need a, you know, explain addition if they already know it. Um, but I also don't want to assume, you know, and I'm not going to knock someone who doesn't know something. Maybe they are great employees and great people and they just haven't had the, um, uh, the experience because I've been fortunate enough to maybe walk into a place that has maybe higher end stuff because at the end of the day we have a job to pay our bills, you know, and in Oregon, especially Carlton, which I think I've had a sneeze that's lost longer than the main road and I passed all the way through to Carlton Farms. Uh, you know, it's different out here. You know, um, it's not like in the city. In the city, I had to put out one serving ad at 160 applicants at one point, you know, and by, were they all great? No. Um, you got a lot more, you know, but at the same time, um, it, you get a little bit more to work with, you know, and so I don't hire out of desperation. When you hire out of desperation, oh, I need someone, first person has a pulse, hire them, never works out. Um, I will work doubles till my eyes fall out by myself and s gladly serve an entire section until I find that right person. So um, hiring with intention and also seeing how they would accent the rest of the group, especially here where we have six, seven servers, you know, and I know that the personality is in the back um, of the house and your support staff. Um, I need a personality that's going to accent everybody. Because even if you know things, if you aren't going to vibe with the team, then you're just going to be a disruption, and that's going to disrupt the guest. Um, and so that's kind of my mentality, my mindset with that. And um, uh, B, when it comes to hiring, um, I want to know 
once again, how receptive they are to learning, you know, and, and if they don't know, I, then they need to be willing to learn. That my pet peeve is when you're explaining to someone, oh, I know, I know, I know. Okay, if you tell me you know, I, I tr trust you. And then uh, down the road, they don't know. You know, it's, you're not impressing me by saying you're gonna know something. I'd rather you say, you know, I don't know. Let's sit down and talk about it, you know. But um, that's kind of the idea of building a great team is, is the personalities and, you know, um, the willingness to learn and care. Um, but, you know, here it's, I have those. Um, everyone has their own experiences, their backgrounds. They accent each other very well. Everyone can high five and call it a day. I take the staff out um, about once a month to a winery um, to, to have them see it. So that way they can recommend places to guests as well as really delving into the wine. Um, and, uh, you know, we all go out and we do that on a regular basis. Um, you know, and I only do one a month. I find if I do more than one a month, their eyes glaze over and it's not as, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't soak in as well. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, you know, it makes it a little more special. Like we were just at Authentique with Nick Keeler, who is uh, a wild man. I thoroughly enjoy him. And we have a lot of his wines on our list. So they can try all the wine. They can see the facility. They can try wine that's not on our list. And once again, they can um, uh, have an education and experience they can bring to the table. Because as much as I have no problem and thoroughly enjoy going table side and hand selling bottles of wine on a regular basis, sometimes it's nice to give, empower the servers a little bit more to go ahead and do that. So when you, uh, what were your initial impressions of the Oregon wine industry? It was different because in the city is definitely a lot different than being in the valley. Um, surprisingly, like a lot, even though it's so close. Um, there wasn't any of that in California as in Orange County. Was it Temecula out there? No disrespect, Temecula. Nothing's exciting. I enjoyed Paso. Paso is great. Um, but Paso is four and a half hours away. It's a different world. Out here, um, I kind of got my sea legs about it. Once again, the education of the Oregon wine industry I picked up in the city was vastly different from out here. Um, being out here uh, is amazing. I don't see myself ever leaving. The sense of community um, is mind blowing. And it's not just relegated to one demographic. It could be, you know, the, the younger generation like the hundred sons and Grant and Grant Coulter and Renee, what they do, and you know Hazel Fern and Brian and Laura, um, you know over there to once again the old guard of you know Drew and and Veronique and and Mike Etzel and John Thomas and John Paul and Ken Wright, like all those, everyone has has really made the community out here uh, mind blowing. And it's all in a good way. I mean, sure, there's obviously maybe some, you know, interpersonal things here and there. But as a whole, it's it's actually that impression I got from moving out here, um, which I didn't see in the city, was absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, we do an industry party, um, uh, you know, and we had John Thomas and Veronique Druin flying from France. And Mike Etzel, and I look in the corner, we had about 120 people here. And you look in the corner, you see those three talking, you're like, my job's complete, actually. My, I've done it. I've seen those three, and they all have their own. Uh, uh, I, I didn't know that John and Veronique actually linked up, and that was one of the people she first met when she moved up. Like, I learned something new every day, you know, uh, to have people like that, and down to even the tasting room people, you know, there's insanely educated people in the taste room and everyone knows each other. And uh, the unsung here is like my buddy Cesar, who's at uh, Druin, or Haley at Zena Crown. Their palates are so technically proficient. It's, it's truly amazing. Um, and to get all these people under one umbrella that is the Oregon wine industry, that's the impression that is lasting and will never change. You know, it is absolutely stunning. Um, and I don't think, um, 
I'll ever see that in any other aspect of anything, whether it be restaurants or other areas of wine or anything. Absolutely stunning. Um, and I'm just grateful and very fortunate to be part of that. Um, and uh, it's truly makes me appreciative at the end of every day. What do you see for the future of the industry? Are there things you're excited about or the things that you're fearful of coming in Oregon wine? You know what, the only thing I'm actually fearful of, I'll start with the, that aspect first, isn't necessarily the wine itself. It's, it's maybe um, the residential growth a little bit. Um, I'm kind of an old soul. So my oldest uh, goes to that new Mountainside High School. Um, when we moved down here, she was ending elementary school and she was in basically the AP program in that area. They didn't offer it down here. And I know being a soon to be middle school and then high school um, kid with your set of friends, it's a big challenge. And I, and I didn't want to disrupt that in her schooling. Um, so my wife and or I dr still drive her every day uh, all the way up there. Um, and the point of that is that when they ripped out like that old blueberry farm and those old farms were clearly they've been in the family for a while. Um, and the people generally probably, you know, just on the surface didn't appear like they were living in the lap of luxury, kind of got pushed out. Or like at the base of my neck of the woods out in North Valley in Shehalem, there's a beautiful old house and it was definitely, you know, falling apart. Um, but there is a little fishing shack and a, and a pond, and they blew that thing out of the water, redirected the pond, and now there's those homes that I <laughs> tried to stay away from in Southwest now that are down there. And, you know, if anything, that's my fear. Uh, you know, that, that it, some of the character is lost, and uh, that's the downfall, and, you know, the wine industry, you know, it probably plays some type of play in that because of the money and the influence of that developers may see. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to do with wine. I don't really have any negative um, thoughts about the future of the wine. I know some people are kind of broody maybe, like, oh, all these newcomers. But with newcomers comes new ideas, um, you know, and just because, you know, uh, someone moves that away out of state, I find that a lot of times the people who are the most um, outspoken over the newcomers actually moved here from somewhere else. They just happen to be first. And that's, <laughs> that's just because you're here first doesn't mean you're any different. Um, and so I don't really see that. I see that there's a lot of potential. Um, you know, I think the, the climate and the environment is always on the forefront um, of that, um, you know. Uh, to kind of go off on a small tangent, but keep it relevant. Um, in 2020, aside from the um, obvious in my world, being out of work and my wife as well, or a partner, um, we had the fires. The fire stopped on my property line. I could care less about smoke. I locked my door um, hastily, thinking that was the last time I'm ever gonna see anything. And why materials and uh, material, uh, materialistic possessions and stuff like that are one thing. It's more or less the, the character and the, the story behind the building itself, as well as some things that aren't replaceable. Um, I was at work and my wife started blowing up my phone and that's when I worked in Lake Oswego and I was like, what, why are you bothering me? I was so busy and then she called the host stand and she's like, there's a fire and I love Susan, she's great. She might be a little <laughs> traumatic at points. I was like, what are you talking about? Is it just smoke from like a neighbor's burn? And then I looked at my phone and almost every neighbor had called me. And I was like, oh no. And I just threw my credit card receipts at whatever server was closest and ran out the door. So I was dressed nicely because I was working. And I pulled up, my wife and kids and dogs were already evacuated. And I started loading up my sheep and goats in the back of my old farm truck. And like the sheriff said, you have to leave them. And I was like, there's no way. Uh, my youngest uh, uh, animals were not even a year old. 
I don't think I, there's no way. The chickens, they got left. The chickens are fine. Uh, we, I'm not loading up chickens, but we just opened the coop. If they wanted to fly, they could fly, but they're more worried about fighting over a cucumber, so they could care less. But I loaded those, the animals up, and um, I ran out the door um, and saw, um, saw what was coming, and I uh, uh, sat in my truck in the neighborhood that neighborhood just complained about, the cookie cutter one. And one of the neighbors is like, can I get you anything, like some water for your animals? Because I didn't even get to leave with that. And they're like, it's like, absolutely, thank you so much. And Laura from Hazelfront called me and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm sitting in my truck watching the top of the fire. And you could just see explosions as trees would hit. And uh, she's like, come over. We'll have a place for the animals. And so they did us a favor and they, uh, they took that on. And, um, without going too far into it, they did me a great uh, service. But ultimately, the point of that is my fear of the climate, you know, is always there. My fear of the fire is always there because it's unfortunately not if it happens again, it's when. And, um, you know, I have some crazy videos of driving up to my property because I slept on my property in my truck after I dropped off the animals, actually. Uh, the uh, sheriff knew I was there even though we weren't supposed to be there, but it's fine. I, I lived, he high-fived me, we had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, reversely, I was able to look after my neighbor's property or older um, because there is kind of people talk about looters and stuff when that was older. The, the awesome part of humanity, half of them help you and the other half want to break into your house. So um, anyways, the, the point of that story was after living through that, the other fear is something on that level. Um, but hopefully we just won't have a neighbor who starts a campfire up in the middle of a hot, dry day anymore with the wind kicked up. So. There's that. Um, but what I'm looking forward to on a positive note is is kind of what I touched on earlier, that those new mindsets of bringing things in. The climate can be a positive. You know, the silver lining of that 2020 vintage of the smoke is people got to, you know, test their, leg, to test their skills out. You know, I love 2012. This is the year I got uh, married. I love 2012 pinos. If you did a bad pinot in 2012, go do something else. Um, uh, everyone here knows that. If you ask anyone in this building, they randomly know that that's my favorite. Uh, we joke that it's the Lord's year. <laughs> that's what, that's what, I like that. But that being said is that saying uh, Pharisees make unskilled sailors is a thing. Um, and so to get, um, instead of the sky is falling, to uh, have a mindset of how we're going to tackle this problem is only going to make us better. It would be a problem of climate, maybe, you know, both how we can manage water, what varietals we can bring in, how we're going to, you know, uh, kind of go around the smoke aspect. Unfortunately, when that happens again um, is all a thing. Um, but ultimately, like I touched on earlier, it's about these winemakers and from beginning to end the staff really making the Oregon wine industry great. Um, that is um, uh, amazing. And that's what I look forward to because I've seen it in just a very short amount of time out here from when I started here to, to, to now, um, how many people have really um, uh, made this place better and it's brought in higher value uh, clients on that level. Um, it's absolutely stunning. So that's, that's what excites me, is what the future has to bring just based on my perception of what I've seen here. And what about for your own future? Obviously, you've got a lot going on right now. Yeah. What are you sort of looking for as a, a new projects or kind of a, a, a vision in your head of what it's going to look like when it's all done? Well, I think there's a common ground that John Paul and I share in the way that Terry always tells him to stop picking on new projects, and I'm constantly looking for them. Um, I don't think I'm going to go crazy as taking on some whole new industry. Um, I'm very happy in restaurants. Uh, pro I'm a lifer. I, I'd say I'll probably be a lifer, but I think at my age, I think I've, <laughs> I've accomplished that. Um, you know, it's, restaurants are a young man's game to an extent. Um, Eventually, I'll probably hit my my limit. Like even on Mother's Day, I was here from 8:30 in the morning to about 11:30 at night, and just walking on like the cement. I'm like, oh, my knees, you know. I was like, it's not the age, it's the mileage, you know. And so I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm dying you know, a little bit. Uh, but that being said, is um, 
you know, there's some smaller projects of like, you know, different animals or livestock. I really want to uh, put quail on our property next. I have a great um, contingent of year-round quail that I randomly feed and I enjoy them. Um, they remind me of my grandfather. Uh, just like my sheep are Navajo because that's when we grew up in Colorado. The Navajo res was there. That's why I have Navajo sheep and hence my, my relationship with Bidewee Farms. Um, but um, the idea is to maintain basically my current uh, projects, but maybe just expand them within reason. It gets easier as my kids get older. Um, it was hard when we put in the vineyard. My youngest one was three, four at the time. So we used to have, like drag a tent down there because we couldn't just leave her in our house way up there, you know? And so we'd bring a tent and like put a bunch of toys in there and let her just go at it. And she's definitely an outdoor kid, but you know, a four-year-old's attention span is like this. So what would have taken you and I maybe a couple of days took uh, Susan and I probably a, a week and a half with that other bus boy who came back to help me. I'm grateful for him. I don't know why. I mean, I paid him, but still it wasn't fun. Uh, you know, luckily we do fall planting, so it was not too crazy in the way of um, weather. Um, but, you know, now we can get a lot more stuff done Was my youngest is eight and she is very self-sufficient. She'll make herself eggs and bacon. She can actually manage a kitchen probably easier than my 16 year old, uh, which is crazy because they're definitely different people. Uh, but that being said is, um, uh, you know, as, it, as they progress and get older, my time gets a little bit more expanded. Um, but, you know, for the future for us, you know, the idea is the main thing is I'd like to put that other block of Chardonnay down. Um, and um, I, there's always a constant development on a property, whether it be an addition of fruit trees, um, a different way of planting, different, you know, aspect of anything that makes your life easier to an extent, you know, uh, more efficient water usage, both for the environment and our land, as well as for our time. Um, and so there's not anything grandiose. Um, I don't really plan on going anywhere. I'll stay here until Tom gets sick of me. And then, uh, you know, which he said isn't happening anytime soon. So I appreciate that. Uh, and, but that being said is, you know, um, I'm very content where I am in life. But, you know, not complacent, but content. Um, and uh, um, it's a good place to be. Last question for you. Uh, tell me about uh, what kind of advice or words of wisdom you'd offer someone looking to get into this side of wine, into the re retail, restaurant, service side of wine. Um, it takes a drive, and everything does, so not to say that others don't, but there's that drive that it takes um, to educate yourself, um, whether it be you know, working long hours, uh, you know, uh, uh, educating yourself, you know, and in this side of wine, the knowledge of food and ingredients is just as important as the wine. Um, it's not one sided. Um, and so constantly learning dishes, what's in season other than just it's harvest for wine period, uh, you know, um, the variable of seasons, obviously 21 and 22 are polarizing. Um, you know, one year I had 30 pounds of cherries in a few days, next year I had zero because they never really ripened. Um, uh, and they, well, why we were being higher elevation thwarted frost a minute, it definitely stunted them. Uh, uh, but that being said is um, there's that drive um, to educate yourself in a few different aspects. Restaurant, hospitality, food, and wine. Um, and there's also the, the need to do it on your own time. If you think you're gonna go into work and get paid and then go home and forget all that, and you only do work when you're getting paid and on the clock is ridiculous. Um, I mean, I do more work um, at home than probably most people do here on their free, in, the, in the building. And it's no disrespect to them, that's just the position I signed up for, but whether it be you know, picking the flowers, all the flowers uh, that are now in the wine room um, come from our place. Um, whether it be the aspect of 
knowing the market, knowing events coming up. Um, I go to wine uh, wineries on a regular basis on my own free time. Um, it's not sponsored by the company or anything like that. It does take a little bit of uh, uh, financial fortitude. It's to me, it's a level of investment. We pay for college and tuition, so me buying, uh, me spending my money and my free time um, is just the same. And at the very least, sometimes I get a, f a few bottles of wine out of it, uh, uh, rather than some books that uh, you can't sell back because they changed the edition again, you know? Because uh, it's weird, they always change the edition and now you can't sell your books back. Uh, but uh, that being said, is, uh, is it takes a little bit of that, you know? Um, you know, I, I, when I worked for Jerry at a per diem, he'd give me about $500 a month, it would vary, uh, to go out and eat. And I was paid to go out, and when I, from the moment I parked, I had to analyze everything. What's the lighting like? What music are they playing? What's the staff wearing? Do they even look mad? Do they even look happy? What was the food like? What was the price point like? You know, all the way down the line. Um, and I thank Jerry for that, because while I don't get a per diem, um, that was the job I had it with, I do that on a regular basis, and I do it now more with wine than I even do with restaurants, um, because um, it's important to analyze things like that, but when it's relevant to your job, and uh, you know, if you want to go down the, the road that I did, it's very important. Um, you know, I, there's an element that you can't just enjoy it as much anymore. Uh, but if you ask any winemaker or anything like that, it's the element of you still enjoy wine, but you still are going to analyze it way more than, you know, my mom would if we opened a bottle of wine right now. She's just going to drink it, say, oh, it's good or it's not good, and then that's that. So there's an element of that, you know. And, and the, other, the other kind of thing that people forget is the people aspect, whether it be, you know, and the hospitality aspect, whether it be you know someone of importance, if you want to say that, or just the everyday person who's coming in to enjoy themselves, there should be no difference at all. Um, and uh, you need to remember that. And there's also people, you know, who are of importance, if you will, that we do business with, um, that aren't going to come in with a sign around their set, neck that says. You know, I'm so and so, owner of this or that. You know, you need to be mindful of that. Um, and interpersonal communication is a giant thing. Sometimes, when you work uh, in not that aspect, you know, when you don't see the, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people a week, you forget that the way you talk to people and the worded, the verbiage you use, and the, your mannerisms are always important. When I'm on work, when I'm at work, I'm always on stage, and if we have that bad employee that I kind of uh, touched on earlier on the floor, then a bad employee isn't someone who's going to walk around and insult a guest or get in a fight with, a, with someone else. They're going to walk around mopey and trippy and whatever and give half-ass service. Um, and you can don't even need to have them for a server, but we all we all can think of the time that you've seen an employee in whatever business you're at. Um, you know they're having a bad day or they're not gonna give you good service and it brings everyone down from beginning to end, you know, and so but that drive um, and, and whatnot is important, but also the level of hospitality and interpersonal communication is absolute key if you wanna be successful, you know. Uh, so those would be my words of advice, is to manage both of those and you'll be great. Humility, actually, thinking out loud. You need to have humility. Now, I don't think that goes far enough anymore. There's a, say, there's a poem uh, called the Siderata, and one of the lines was, uh, that, you know, you don't compare yourself to others because you'll always be either become vain or bitter because there's always someone greater or lesser than yourself. You know, um, and I think people need to take that to heart. That's an excellent answer to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's all the questions that I have for you. Uh, is there anything that I didn't ask that I should have? Anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover? No, I don't think so too much. Um, I think you got me on a couple of good tangents, but uh, <laughs> ultimately, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a pleasure. And and just like all these people, I I uh, kind of spoke on earlier. It's it's uh, excellent to meet you. I hope I see all four of you in the in the restaurant. You always have a place here. Um, I uh, thoroughly uh, treat this place like my house, 
And to be honest, I spend more time here than my house probably. <laughs> so that being said, is it was a pleasure. And uh, just like I said earlier, I'm fortunate enough to have even someone such as yourself come interview me. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Appreciate you taking the time to share your stories with us. Go ahead and let you off the hook. Cool. Thank you.